morning, everybody, uh, and welcome. Welcome to our program tonight entitled Cybersecurity Lawyers and Judges Legal Ethics in an Age of Technology. Um, we have a terrific speaker from Albany Law School tonight, who my colleague uh, Carrie Ann Crawford will introduce in a minute. This is a program tonight that is jointly sponsored by Albany Law School and the Administrative Judicial Institute, the New York City Office of Administrative. Uh, trials and hearings. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ray Kramer. I'm an administrative law judge uh, for many years at the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. I also direct the Administrative Judicial Institute. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Carrie Ann Crawford, who is counsel to the Institute. Um, just a little bit about the Institute. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, we serve as the educational entity for New York City uh, administrative law judges, hearing officers, and uh, our programs have long included um, ALJs throughout New York State and public sector attorneys, as well as uh, attorneys who regular, regularly practice before uh, administrative law tribunals. We regularly sponsor CLE accredited programs and uh, Albany uh, is co-sponsoring uh, this program with us tonight. Um, we're delighted to be able to co-host the program with the law school. Uh, and, and I'll say, uh, as I said privately to uh, Dean Rosenberger, we hope to do this again in the future. And if you want to, uh, looking forward to that. So I just wanted to welcome everyone. And before we introduce the speaker, uh, Dean Rosenberger, I'll, I'll turn the program over to you to say a few words. Thank you very much. Yes, we're excited to be co-sponsoring this with you um, as well. I'd like to welcome our many guests this, this evening, not only from the Institute, but also from the wider community, the Albany Law School Alumni Network. Even some of our students are with us tonight, and that includes some of our online graduate students who are both lawyers and non-lawyers. Um, among them, uh, we have students from our cybersecurity and data privacy graduate program, which is one of our five graduate programs. And I'd like to mention that because a lot of folks don't know that Albany Law has gone beyond the JD. Of course, still our bread and butter is the JD, but we've expanded our mission and reach to educating uh, folks who are, are not necessarily all attorneys and cybersecurity and data privacy is obviously one of those areas where that uh, need is in the marketplace, whether it's government or really all across um, the private sector. So if anybody's interested in learning any more about what we're doing there in the graduate space, um, you can find me online. I'd be happy to connect with anyone at any time. So thanks again. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, just a quick housekeeping note. I will be monitoring the Q&A chat. So if you have any questions or comments for our speaker at any point throughout the night, just type it in there and I will be reading them out loud. Our speaker tonight is Professor Anthony Haynes. Mr. Haynes is currently an Associate Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives at Albany Law School, where he created the Online Graduate School as well as the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Program. Mr. Haynes has trained hundreds of senior leaders in finance, government, and the military on cybersecurity and data privacy, and has been a guest lecturer at Harvard University, the University of Maryland, the University of Albany, SUNY, and other institutions. He has advised a number of organizations, including financial institutions and technology companies on cybersecurity. Prior to assuming his current role, he practiced for several years at two large global law firms where he handled matters involving national security, commercial litigation, and intellectual property. Prior to that, Mr. Haynes was a professor of computer science at the Air Force Academy, where he developed the Academy's cybersecurity curriculum, and also has served as an intelligence officer in the US Air Force, where he focused on information operations. He earned a BS from the US Air Force Academy where he was recognized as the top computer science graduate, an MS in computer science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and a JD from Georgetown University Law Center. Thank you very much for agreeing to speak for us tonight, Professor Haynes, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much for that graceful introduction. 
And what I like to do is go ahead and share my screen. So I'll take one moment here. And then while I'm doing that, maybe give a little bit of a, a background as well. Let's see. So if all goes well, we'll have a nice little background here. It's like a computer person. And hopefully one of, uh, let's see, my, uh, there we go. So hopefully everybody sees that. Can I get a thumbs up? Excellent. Great. So before I dive into the body of the presentation, I want to give a kind of a brief overview of what I think of as the, the brief history of cybersecurity in the United States. When I was in the Air Force in the 1990s, we were trying to figure out as the military how to weaponize viruses and malware. Our focus was on using these tools to attack our adversaries. But then in the 2000s, there was a paradigm shift when we recognized that among all the nations in the world, the United States is the one that's the most vulnerable to cyber attack. And as a result, we needed to figure out how we could best defend against cyber attack. And that paradigm went on for about 15 years or so. And then around 2015 or so, 2016, 2017, there was a third or a second paradigm shift into a third paradigm. And the view then was recognition that no matter how good our cyber walls were, the malicious or the bad actors would eventually penetrate those walls and breach our data. And so the paradigm moved to one of disaster response. The hurricane or the flood or the tornado will come. And so how do we respond to it becomes the question. And in a universe of disaster response, your focus is less on IT technology, less on firewalls and intrusion detection systems and virus scanners, and more on policies and procedures and controls the kinds of things that lawyers and judges are traditionally very good at. So I find it very appropriate that last year, the New York State Associations for Lawyers decided to make it a requirement for continuing education to have some competency in cybersecurity and data privacy. For me, it's really been a long time coming and a bit overdue. And that brings us to today's CLE on cybersecurity lawyers and judges, and the tag is legal ethics in the age of technology. So the proposed agenda for today's presentation is to talk about cyber attacks that lawyers and judges have seen, the ethical duty of technology competence, as well as the duty for reasonable cybersecurity, have a break, and then from the break, come back and talk about the fundamentals of incident response and contracting issues in cloud computing. Now, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to either raise your hand, type in the Q&A, and Carrie Ann will do her best to bring it up to me. I'm more than happy and actually eager to pause or to take small steps back to answer these questions that may be on your mind as they come up. Well, let's go ahead and proceed. What are some of the cyber attacks that judges and lawyers have seen and really that American society has seen over the past couple of years? But what we've noticed is that cyber conflicts have really escalated over time. For example, in 2021, we had the um, virus of solar winds breaching a number of systems in the West and the attribution of this malware to the Russian Federation. And as a response, the current administration in DC, the Biden administration, um, decided to hold accountable the Russian Federation for the SolarWinds hack. A matter of fact, by executive order, and there's been one since then in 2022 as well, but this is the first one, uh, the President of the United States declared a national emergency that I find extremely interesting. And the language here is very interesting. It says that I, the President of the United States, find that specified harmful foreign activities of the government of the Russian Federation, in particular, efforts to undermine the conduct of free and fair democratic elections and democratic institutions in the United States and its allies and partners to engage in and to facilitate malicious cyber-enabled activities against the United States and its allies and its partners constitutes an unusual and extraordinary threat to national security, foreign policy, and the economy of the United States. I hereby declare a national emergency. So the volume of threats from nations like the Russian Federation, like China, like North Korea, like Iran, has reached such severity that every single year, if you look at the intelligence threat assessment from the Director of National Intelligence, you will see continued remarks about the dangers of these organizations 
in their efforts to undermine the United States. Which brings us to the next topic, which is this idea that the ongoing attacks that happened in 2021, 2022, 2023 is not really an anomaly, but will perpetuate going forward in time. So there is a site that's great for data visualization. The data is beautiful, information is beautiful, and it gives you these kind of bubbles for what it sees as the size, the number of records lost in the organization. And as you can see, Facebook had nearly half a billion records violated in one of the major data breaches. Microsoft, a quarter of a billion records. Oxydata, a third of a billion records. So we're seeing very, very large data breaches happening. And if you look at the chart as a timeline over time, you'll see that the number of individual breaches and the number of records per breach have continued to escalate. So what are the things that I tell my students and I tell people who ask me questions about cybersecurity, different organizations, one of the hard questions is this. Every year, the amount of money that we put into tools and technology, as well as into personnel to address cybersecurity increases, the amount of attention from legislatures and courts and executive agencies also increases. And yet, despite the increasing amount of attention, we still at the same time also have faced increasing sizes in those data breaches. It leads to something of a paradox. How is it possible that we're able to continue to put all this money into data breaches and yet at the same time see increasing number of breaches here? And so in the back of my mind is this important question to think about. But the bottom line here is everyone is really and truthfully a target. In finance, for example, we saw an unknown group of hackers in multiple countries steal around a billion dollars from a variety of big banks. In healthcare, for example, Anthem, was hit with a major data breach. And then in New York State, there was an attack on the critical infrastructure on the dam um, by some Iranian hackers. So we're seeing these attacks occurring everywhere you can imagine. Of course, there is also a breach in South Carolina where some uh, social security numbers were stolen from the government. So this is all extremely interesting um, and shows how everyone is a target to cyber attacks. So hackers have broken into computer systems in the White House, the State Department, IRS, OPN, the Pentagon, federal court systems. Courts and law firms are considered by attackers to be one-stop shops because they have high value information and perhaps the biggest weaknesses that you will see uh, in a number of businesses. So one example of the severity and significance of these types of breaches is the attack on the law firm of Mossack Fonseca which you may have known um, as the Panama Papers. And so the files there revealed that there are offshore accounts and holdings for 140 politicians and public officials from around the world. The data included information about the Prime Minister of Ireland, the Ukrainian president, and the King of Saudi Arabia. More than 214,000 offshore entities appeared in the leak and they were connected to people in more than 200 countries and territories. Major banks have driven the creation of these hard to trace companies in these different offshore havens. And as a result of this, the founders of Masa Fonseca faced legal charges and were arrested on money laundering charges. So the data breach led to the embarrassment and a matter of fact, um, sanctions and consequences for a number of officials around the world and problems for the for on those of the, of the law firm. All right. Cravath, well, gotcha. A number of US based law firms have faced cyber attacks, and you'll see this over time. For example, in 2016, hackers broke into the networks of a number of big firms and were able to expose information about federal investigations, as well as whether they stole inside information about potential mergers and other types of events um, that could be a big deal. In particular, Cravath and well, gotcha, uh, saw information about mergers being potentially exposed by these attacks. And of course, courts are being attacked as well. Not the least, although the last in my case of examples here, in that uh, the U.S. Congress has requested, as recently as last summer, information about how better to defend the federal courts, in this case, um, from cyber attacks. 
And, and the fact that in this example, three foreign hackers were able over a period of time to get access to sealed court filings. And as you know, this is important to maintain confidentiality and information for the parties and litigation before the court. Um, to have these sealed filings exposed is a major um, violation of, of confidentiality and so on. And in addition to that, uh, the attackers are able to actually make new filings as if they had been properly authorized by the systems. So in testimony for Congress, some judges asked for more money and more help in securing uh, these judicial systems. Ten years ago, uh, then director of the FBI, Mueller, said there's only two kinds of organizations, those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked again. And this is, again, the paradigm shift from trying to build the perfect cyber castle, cyber walls, to recognizing that after you build your castle, you're still going to have to address the breaches that will eventually get through your beautiful cyber walls. So that brings us to a model rule 1.1, New York Rule of Personal Conduct 1.1, on competence and this idea of technology competence. So I know I can't see all of you in the audience, but I can imagine you talking back to me. You can say, well, Dean Haynes, we didn't become judges and lawyers to become experts on information technology. If I wanted to become a computer programmer, I would have, like you, when you were starting on your career, majored in computer science. I went to law school to be a lawyer. And so the, the question here is, what does it mean for lawyers to actually show technology competence? But before I dive into that more directly, I want to define a couple of key terms that may facilitate an understanding of the discussion. Sorry, so, Professor, before you can before you go down this line of um, thought, we have a comment. Um, uh, perhaps Moore's law that overall computing chip speed capacity progresses geometrically on a two-year basis explains the paradox of increase in attention to cybersecurity, not yielding a decrease in breaches or attacks. Um, notwithstanding that Moore's great law is probably no longer holding true. Yes. Yeah, great, great comment. So uh, several decades ago, I, I believe it was the 1980s or 1970s, don't quote me on that, there was an observation that it appeared at that time, 40, 50 years ago, that every couple of years, every 18 months in some fields, and every 24 months in others, every it, it would vary, two to three years, uh, you will see a doubling in processing speed, source capacity, or halving in cost are both at the same time. And there's observation that as the size of the individual gates on computer chips got smaller and smaller, eventually they'll be so close together that you would have quantum dynamics taking effect. And that would disrupt the ability of the more classical dynamics to work place. And so right now in 2020, that's where we are. The, the, the gates are so narrow that we're having to think about doing quantum tunneling. So the thought from the commentator is that as the power of software gets greater because of this observation from Moore's law, that could potentially explain the, the increasing threat number. I think it's a great suggestion. Um, another thought that I have is that the way we create systems is that we don't design security in the forefront. For most organizations, for most companies, the goal is to be first to market, first dog, first dog early mover to get market share and get profits. And so security is an afterthought if it is thought about at all. So that means we're, we're releasing systems that are unsecured by design. And so as we have greater reuse of these systems, smart thermostats and smart doorknobs and smart shoes, everything's a smart device, then all those devices have vulnerabilities. And so that, that could be another reason for it. But, but I think these are all good points and good thoughts on that. Thank you. So back to the terms. So we have this idea of cybersecurity, and there's a number of definitions. If you're in my class, I'd have you looking at the NIST standards and CNSS standards and so on. Um, for our purposes, we'll just call it this idea of IT security, cybersecurity, and it's protecting information systems from theft or damage to the hardware, the software, and to the information on them, as well as from disruption and or misdirection of the services they provide. Um, a, a cybersecurity event is any kind of occurrence that might be suspicious. A cybersecurity incident is an event that is clearly harmful, and the data breach is a cybersecurity incident where there's been a confirmed compromise of confidential information. Like most of Fonseca was a clear data breach. So there's typically, no, in every state, every one of our states, there's a data breach notification law where if there's a data breach, you're obligated to notify those who are impacted by it within a certain time frame. So there's a legal obligation tied to a data breach where you may not see one tied to an incident or an event. 
two-factor authentication uh, was a big deal. We've gotten used to it now, but it's, you got to have your password plus your cell phone or some kind of pin code. It's kind of annoying, but it is the right thing to do. It's more secure. And then we also have phishing, which again, everybody should know now. It's a fake email. Somebody's trying to trick you into thinking it's your colleague or your boss or subordinate, and they want information from you. So it's, this, it's the social engineering. And then encryption is this idea of just, I think to uh, your uh, Captain Crunch Dakota ring, like your Caesar cipher, all A's or B's, all B's or C's. And so if I make that more complicated and more mathematical, I'll take plain text, feed it into a mathematical algorithm, and then come up with a series of, of gibberish, zeros and ones or hexadecimal. That'll be my encrypted communication. A botnet is a big zombie army. I think a bunch of computers and I, and I infect them and they all help me in some task. Maybe I want to infect computers to mine Bitcoin, or maybe I want to go ahead and besiege the whitehouse.gov website. But I'm going to have a bunch of computers working with me in my botnet. And then the patching is, if you learn nothing else from this CLE, the thing you must remember is always patch. So there is some uh, flexibility about exactly which is the, co the correct standard of care for what's reasonable or adequate type of security. It could vary based upon industry, the size and scope of your organization, the neighbor nature of the data that you're handling. But no matter what, a basic standard that's gonna be the minimum is you have to update your patching. So when Windows says you need to update the software, go ahead and update it. That, that's this idea of, of fixing the bugs is minimal competence. Okay, so now that we've gone through the definitions, let's go and go into ABA model rule, New York State Real Professional Conduct 1.1 and talk about this idea of competence. And then we'll go into 1.6, confidentiality, and some comments on the proposed ABA rules that have been adopted in some states like Virginia, comments 19 through 21. Okay, so under rule 1.1, a lawyer is required to provide competent representation to a client. Competent representation requires the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for the representation. You know this. This is back to your legal profession class in law school, or you may have had a refresher recently. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Well, comment eight is where the wrinkle comes in. Comment eight says that to maintain that requisite knowledge and skill, a lawyer should, number two, keep abreast of the benefits and risks associated with technology the lawyer uses to provide services to clients or to store and transmit confidential information. So now you've got an obligation based upon having a law degree and having a, a, a certification as a licensed lawyer to keep abreast of technology, which seems kind of radical, but it is now the status. And there's a number of publications and going back here to this one from the American Bar Association about old wine in a new bottle. So confidentiality and technology we come to 1.6 now. So we've always had an obligation to preserve our clients', clients secrets. And the phrasing here is that a lawyer shall exercise reasonable care to prevent the lawyer's employees, associates, and others whose services are utilized by the lawyer from disclosing or using the confidential information of the client. So this word here, reasonableness, is a key component, reasonable care. But you may have heard of chat GPT. It's this computer program, this AI program that can generate answers to questions. So you say, chat GPT, what is the standard of care for negligence? And it'll tell you whatever, duty, breach, actual process causation, and damage. Like, it'll give you the answer to that. Um, so it's good enough to get you an A on a, on a college English test. And when I was running it for law school answers, maybe get you a C, C minus in law school. So you won't be an A or B student, but you'll, you might want fail, right? It's pretty good. Um, so reasonableness is this word you'll see a lot when you type in these chat GPT answers, but you need to know what the factors are. Like what are the factors for what actually constitutes reasonableness? Well, let's go through some examples first. <laughs> What's not reasonable? So autocomplete is not reasonable. For example, a law firm, and you can, well, it's, it's in the text here. I was going to say you can guess, but I wrote it in the text here. Um, had this issue where they inadvertently sent email to the wrong recipient. It so happened that the partner was intending to email a client, but autocomplete put in the name of a journalist. And so the information email went to the journalist, which was really embarrassing. Now, Wilma Hale said to the 
journalists, please don't publish this. This is confidential information. We have to maintain attorney-client confidentiality. And the Wall Street Journal said, uh, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a party to your litigation. And journalists published all kinds of secrets and they went ahead and published it. And of course, the response was, we are disappointed that the journal has decided to publish private information it knew was protected by our client's legal privilege. We are taking additional measures designed to ensure that emails are not misaddressed to unintended recipients. So be careful, out of complete. This is not reasonable. This is unreasonable. This doesn't meet the standard. This is an example here. You've got to check that. And we've all made those mistakes. If you don't send it to somebody who has a legal obligation or an ethical obligation to allow you to claw it back or to inform you you misdelivered it, then you're going to be out of luck. Wilmer Hill. So the uh, New York State Bar Association has an ethics opinion about this. And the question is, can I use an email service provider that scans my email for advertising purposes? In other words, Gmail. Everybody has a, almost everybody has a Google Mail account, Gmail account, and Google makes money by scanning our emails for keywords and then typing up advertisements based upon those keywords. Well, that means if I'm using it for legal services to communicate with a, a party in litigation or a client, then isn't that going to breach confidentiality because there's some third party who's not inside of the attorney-client relationship that's going to be able to see the email? Well, the answer is a lawyer may use Gmail, an email service provider that conducts computer scans of emails to generate computer advertising where the emails are not reviewed by or provided to human beings other than a sender recipient. Now, I personally think that this is a meaningless distinction. I personally think this is a bad idea, but I practically and professionally understand what was likely the rationale behind the NYSBA. If you are trying to practically get legal services out to people who are not tech savvy and or you yourself are not tech savvy, the practical best option might be to use unencrypted email like Google Mail, like Gmail, and allow for the scanning to happen. So I think as a matter of practice, this was a decision that was made in 2008 by the Bar Association. Now, it wouldn't surprise me if, as we older lawyers begin to retire and move out, that newer lawyers come in and revisit this decision and require encryption going forward. Oh, and, oh, and on this particular <laughs> decision itself that it's only computers and human beings, there was testimony before the US Congress by Google, and Google told the legislators that um, it does allow other companies that are not Google to scan and share data from Gmail accounts. And that, not only that, employees, human beings, and these third-party contractors to Google are also able to read people's actual emails. So the assumption that Gmail is only being read by a computer program isn't even accurate at that point. <laughs> they actually do have human beings read emails too. So, but then again, no one's changed their, the, uh, the, the policy determination at this point. Um, I will make a footnote, and it may be later in this presentation, that if there are certain situations where it's reasonable for the lawyer to expect there's a heightened chance that the client's information could be compromised, and there is a legal duty for the lawyer to advise the client. For example, if you're a divorce lawyer um, and the spouses are in a divorce where you're using the same computer to communicate with you, the lawyer, you should tell your client, hey, you might want to get a different computer because your spouse could read our communications. That could be a problem. Or if you're looking at a wrongful termination, labor law, employee dispute, um, and the, your client's using the, the employer's computer network or computer email, you might tell your client, hey, look, you don't want to use the employer's computer because by most uh, employee uh, work agreements, both employee handbooks, the employer has the right to read your email. So there's no confidentiality here. So you might want to go ahead and not use the employer's computer network. So there are situations that, that are carve outs here, but in general, um, it's okay. So what about securing information? So the question here is, what are the factors for determining reasonable efforts? What in, when is encryption required? And what considerations are offered as guidance um, to all of this? And we've discussed this a little bit here about some of the factors here about uh, what makes sense. What about remote access to your files? So in the pandemic era, <laughs> remote work became the norm. Uh, and, and the question is, well, is there a concern about cybersecurity when you're remotely accessing things that are in the office? And the answer is a law firm 
or a court system may give its lawyers or court employees remote access to client files that the lawyer may work from home as long as the firm determines that the particular technology used provides reasonable protection to client confidential information or in the absence of such reasonable protection if the law firm obtains informed consent from the client after informing the client of the risks. So yes, you can do that and we've been doing it. Okay, what about the duty to protect the confidentiality of email communications with, with one's client? And so again here, this is my point I made earlier that where there is a, a risk that the lawyer knows or should know about a potential um, third party, then you've got to advise your client about it. So you can just mention this as well. Okay, so under uh, New York Rule of Professional Conduct, ABA Rule 1.6, a lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure of or authorized access to information relating to the representation of a client. So what does this mean? Uh, oh, actually, this is my review question point. Oh, I got to the first review question. So here we go. So I, I've, I'm trying to figure out how to engage with several hundred people through a webinar because I can't actually see you. I can't have breakout rooms. I can't get Zoom chat. So my, my, my innovation was this. I will embed questions in the presentation and then um, uh, Dean Rosenberger um, will then provide an A, B, C, D, E choice. And so you have to read the question and then pick an answer. And I'll give everybody uh, 30 seconds to a minute to read the question and read the choices here. And I, I, Dean Rosenberg, if you could go ahead and, 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 and trigger the poll here. Um, and so we'll see what people think is the best answer. <laughs> this is gonna be great. We'll see how my strategy works out. All right, one response coming in. Wait, only I can see this so far, right, Dean Rosenberger? It's, it's hitting to the group so far? I believe so. After okay. we close it, we can publish the results. Okay, great. All right, this is, this is so cool. What is the judge's or the lawyer's ethical requirement for technical competency under New York Rule Official Conduct 1.1c? Oh, I love seeing this in real time. For me, it's like watching a horse race. I'm seeing like different answers are competing. This is this. Oh, I see a hand is raised. Uh, perhaps our expert facilitators can help with the person whose hand is raised. It looks like Joseph raised his hand. Joseph, I can allow you to speak if you want to ask a question. You should be able to. Screen is blocking the. We I can't read it because the screen is blocking for me for to put the answer in. Is that better? It's blocking. I can. It, you have the the poll untitled poll A B C D E F, but it's blocking on my screen my ability uh... to read the five questions. All right, so choice A, keep abreast of the benefits and risks associated with technology the lawyer uses to provide services to clients or to store or transmit confidential information. Choice B, be technically proficient with implementing and maintaining technology such as firewall configuration, router programming, and intrusion detection system audit log evaluation necessary to safeguard client confidential information. Choice C, ensure that the lawyer's firm, even if it's a solar practitioner or department, if within a large organization, complies with ISO 27001, which provides annual surveillance audits and certification every three years. Choice D, implement a secure email communication protocol, such as pretty good privacy, that encrypts and decrypts all email communications with clients. And E, none of the above. I see there's some more hands here. And I see, uh, I think some hands are still raised. Uh, Kevin Jones, you can go ahead. Yeah, if it if one piece is overlaying another, you just need to click um, and grab a hold of the top of the of the window and move it out of the way. <laughs> so the the poll, uh, Anthony, the poll box pops up over your slide. So folks just need to move the poll box sort of off the screen. I see. Back. So I I see. So. If I minimize the poll box on my screen, it won't help them. Each person has to, on his or her screen, individually minimize it, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So I will close the poll out now. I know some people would, would did not get a chance to re reply to it, and, and I apologize. I, oh, too soon. Can I go back? Ah, oh, here we go. Can everybody see the poll now? Yes. So choice A was the most popular result. Uh, Two thirds picked A. And let's see. Yes, A is the best answer. 
Okay, so we had um, about 20%, one fifth pick B. So you as a lawyer individually do not have to be smart on technology. You don't have to maintain the technology yourself. You can have a staff member or a consultant. So you can have an IT department or somebody who comes in and helps you out. You could have a son or a daughter-in-law help you out, for example, right? Um, you need to keep abreast of the benefits and risks. That's the key here. And then CDE all had less than 5%. Okay. All right, good. Thank you so much. That was very helpful to me. Okay. Let's go down to... Oh, the code word, first code word of two is security. The first code word for, of two is security. And I think there's some Q&A questions there that I may not have gotten to. Uh, so if now might be a good time to do that. Just people um, trying to help their colleagues with moving the poll screen. So we're good for you to continue. Okay, great. I will do so. All right. So what about reasonable cybersecurity? So we've had this idea of technology competence and this idea of confidentiality coming together to create this idea of reasonable security. Sorry, um, we have someone's hand raised, um, Noreen Van Doren. Oh, nope, it looks like they disappeared. Maybe that was a mistake. Okay, okay. you can go ahead. And I see that Joseph's hand is still raised. I don't know if he intends to lower his hand. Okay, thank you, perfect. Looks good, great. So, so a hard question is what is reasonable for cybersecurity and how what's reasonable will vary based upon the nature of the data, nature of the industry, nature of your organization. And um, I'm pointing at the Center for Internet Security, CIS's Critical Security Controls, as a potential indicator of what is reasonable. So we have a duty to safeguard confidential information. We have the common law duty known as attorney-client privilege. We have a number of legal statutes for medical data, HIPAA high tech, financial, Brown Bleak Liley, Sarbanes Oxley. We have the payment card interface standard for personal and different information. We have a number of standards that are out there. Um, there may be fiduciary agency guidelines as well. We've talked about legal ethics in some detail here and um, under 1.6 in particular. And then the point that I wanna go down now is that Virginia has adopted in 2016, the ABH proposal for modifying rule 1.6 D. And I think this is a direction that New York State is moving towards and in coming years may also adopt. It's just a little bit slower as, as we see in this state here. Okay, so exactly what are reasonable efforts to protect client data under the ABA proposed comments 19, 20, and 21 as adopted um, in Virginia in 2016? So under comment 19, there are several factors that should be considered in determining what is reasonable. First of all is how sensitive the information is. For example, when I got a parking ticket in Troy, New York, I communicated with an attorney because I didn't want to go in court myself via Gmail, and I wasn't worried about anything happening if that fact got exposed. And I would think it's reasonable to use Gmail because it's not that sensitive. It's not a murder case. It's not a million dollar merger and acquisition. It made sense here. What is the risk of disclosure if additional measures are not taken? Did you employ or use IT professionals to help you out? What is the cost of additional safeguards? You may have a point of diminishing returns where from a cost to benefit analysis, it doesn't make sense to do so. How difficult is it to implement additional safeguards? Will it interfere with your communicating with the client? Maybe you should encrypt email, but you have a client so you don't know how to do that and can't do that. And so you could create a conflict there. So you wanna be sure that you can actually engage in representing the clients. It's all important here under comment 19. Under comment 20, there's a safe harbor. So when Virginia passed their version of the proposed comments to the ABA rules, a number of small law firms and sole proprietors pushed back saying, look, we are not IT experts and the burden on us to keep oppressive technology is too high. So there's a safe harbor here. And it says this, a lawyer is not subject to discipline under this rule if the lawyer has made reasonable efforts to protect electronic data, even if there's a data breach or a cyber attack or other incident resulting in the loss, destruction, misdelivery, or theft of confidential client information. So just do your best effort here. In other words, there's a recognition that perfect security is just not attainable. It cannot be perfect. 
and even large businesses and organizations in the government that do have very sophisticated systems have suffered data breaches. The OPM, the White House, the DOD, federal federal courts. I mean, it's, it's, it's common to big companies. What's reasonable depends on the size of the firm. Lawyers themselves do not have to be tech savvy, but you need to have somebody on your payroll or if you use a consultant who is tech savvy. Comment 21, lawyers should keep abreast on an ongoing basis and have a periodical review of security measures, including are your staff being trained? So you have an annual training of your staff. Maybe you have an outside consultant or your IT department sending fake emails or simulated phishing emails to your staff to see if they don't click on them. To verify that, for example. Do you have procedures when people depart? Do you take back their ID badge and their physical key to the building? And do you turn off their, their email password? Basic security measures for departing employees. Do they return laptops and smartphones and devices? Do third-party vendors have access to the store client data? So if the court system needs to have a vendor to help it, is the vendor properly constrained? When the vendor's contract ends, does the vendor's access to data end? Does the vendor have an obligation not to make a copy of the data? How do you back up information? What happens if there's a, a, a cyber attack that destroys or modifies your data? Can you restore it from backups, for example? You need to have strong passwords and use some type of authentication measures on devices and networks. It's very important. And then again, do you have some kind of hardware software system like a firewall or an intrusion detection system to detect and respond to intrusion, most of software act and, and, and other activities on the, on the networks? Actually, I have a, a, a question about this, reasonable efforts to protect client data. I'm thinking specifically uh, for courts when you know everything went remote and people are now accessing their case files and all sorts of confidential data from their home networks that you know have a wide variety of security measures or VPNs or firewalls or none of those things at all. What, what, what does reasonable look like in that case when you have people who were formerly in an office now scattered to the winds? Right. So I, I don't think what's reasonable changes. So even if you're doing remote work, you and your organization still has to make efforts to preserve the client's secrets and to preserve confidentiality. So what it means then from a technical point of view is you should have a virtual private network or a VPN. And a common one is Citrix. So you may have Citrix go to meeting, for example. Um, that's a common technical measure. What it means then is that you should require passwords to help authenticate users. So you have an email password, for example. Um, what it means is, is that your IT department or whoever is helping with that side of it needs to monitor network activity to see if people are connecting to your network who are unusual. So you should know as an organization, we have 100 employees and we've given out 100 laptops and we know the machine address codes. We, 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 know, their, we know the identifiers of the laptops and oh, that's weird. Somebody who's not authorized needs to be coming to the network or you know the home address, you know the, the locations for the IPs. It's like, well, that's weird, it's a weird connection point. So you're monitoring for unusual activity as part of it. So these are all basic things that you do regardless of being remote, it doesn't go away here. Um, the issues that may become newer may be issues such as what happens if people are, are in the home environment and they're wandering around and you're dealing with client secrets. So you still have an obligation to try to have a closed door so you don't have third parties coming in, for example. But yeah, yeah, good questions. Any more? Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, there's another question. Um, is a solo practitioner held to the same security reasonableness, reasonableness standards as a hundred attorney law firm? So <laughs> the, the answer is, the short answer is no. The short answer. The more complicated answer is, I would argue in, as far as the spirit goes, the answer is yes because of the factors, right? So if you go back to the five or six factors that we had under, uh, where was I? Is it here? Uh, yes, comment 19, these six factors. So if I, if I say yes, what I mean by yes is these six factors are being applied to the solo practitioner 
and to the 100 person firm. If I say no, what I mean is when I apply those factors, the ability of that solo practitioner to do things is going to be different, right? However, again, when I'm, when I'm saying yes, if the solo practitioner is doing a billion dollar merges and acquisition and does it encrypt any client data, then that's just not going to be reasonable under this first factor of how sensitive is the information itself. What, what, what's that point there? I say, I say, does it matter if you're one person, 100 people? It's, it's the data is really sensitive. You've, you've got to do it, right? Um, so, so that might be a factor, but if it's going to be looking at, we're, we're, we're trying to help people do, uh, seating tickets, for example, um, then that's going to be not a sensitive, it's going to be a lower scale here. So, so what I would say is, is that the same factors are being applied, but when I look at the, the, uh, the, the solo partition is, is different. And then don't forget, there's a safe harbor here about doing your best. And so what seems to be happening is that enforcement agencies are using a different scale. And I haven't had a chance to see what the ethics bars are doing, the bar associations are doing from the ethical point of view, but I've seen it from the, from the litigation, is that most of those cases end up getting settled pretty quickly. So it's not actually a, a long point. But it, but it seems to me that the standards are slightly different depending on the size of the organization. That's how it seems. But yes, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Okay, so, so that's comment 21, 19, um, and 20. So what I suggest is that uh, in East Greenbush, New York, there's an organization called the Center for Internet Security, and they provide uh, intrusion detection services for all of the 50 states, governments, and many local governments as well. And they also are the custodians of the um, critical security controls for cybersecurity. And there's 20 of them. And I'm going to talk about the first three. I'll skip the other ones here. Um, but if you do these first three, then you will eliminate a number of vulnerabilities on cybersecurity and data privacy. The first one says inventory all of your hardware. Know all of these smartphones and laptops and routers, all the devices on your network. That's the first control. Number two is inventory all of your software on all of your devices. So for every device, know it's running Windows, it's running Linux, it's running Mac OS, it's running Android, it's running whatever it's running, it's running the Office application. And then the third one is apply patches. So as there's these, these bug fixes, apply them. Those are three that I want to focus on. So this is the bare minimum of what's considered reasonable. Um, and as, again, there's, there's a bunch, and this is actually an older version. They've condensed it to make it slightly fewer. But again, the first three haven't changed on the safeguards. You can also look at other industry guidelines and what you'll see is there's, there's common patterns across these different guidelines in different industries. So looking at the very first Center for Internet Security's control inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices here, that first control, the NIST 853 standard has different parts that correlate with that control. The NIST core framework, the International Standards Organization, ISO 27002, HIPAA, FFIEC, they all seem to kind of have some common analyses and overlap. So you'll see some general ideas. Now, again, each standard or framework will have things that are unique to that particular framework or standard, but in general, there's a lot of overlap as well. Oh, and my last comment here. So what's interesting to me is that different parts of the world are falling to what I think of as three general data protection regimes. And so in the background, be aware of this. Why? Because if you are a US company that's operating on data impacting the citizens of a European Union and EU citizens country, then those EU laws will apply and vice versa. So, so it kind of matters. Um, it's a way of thinking about this. So, I, I see the U.S. approach as being more sector by sector and more harms based. So we wait for there to be a harms and then we deal with that injury. I see the European Union's approach to the GDPR as being more rights based. So we have basic rights protections for citizens as opposed to being harms based. It's an umbrella approach. So it, it, it spans every industry. So you don't have a separate 
data privacy and cybersecurity standard in the European Union for healthcare, like we have HIPAA high tech. And then for finance, we have Glambic Lyons, I mean, we, we don't have these, this kind of segmenting approach, it's, it's one big umbrella. And then the third area is gonna be, I think of as China and the PIPL, which is more authoritarian um, and, and, more, and more centralized um, than both the EU and the US. So second quick question here, um, somebody put in comments that the poll itself tends to cover up the question. It'd be nice to do them side by side. And my apologies is that I didn't have time to give the questions to embed them in the poll, which is why we do it normally. So I kind of made the questions at the last minute here. So this, this is probably gonna be a little cover up here, but before we do the poll, um, have everybody look at the questions and read it first. Uh, we'll spend about 30 seconds to a minute reading the question. And then about a minute from now, Dean Rosenberger will put the poll up. And then that way everybody have, will have had a chance to read the question before the poll shows. And the question's prompt is, which statement below best describes the minimum to satisfy a lawyer's duty to exercise reasonable efforts to preserve client confidences under New York Rule of Professional Conduct, ABA Model Rule 1.6C? We'll take just maybe a little minute to read other choices there, and then we'll put the poll up, and that way we can hopefully avoid the, the overlapping issue. And I see someone has his or her hand raised. I think it's Alan. Alan, you should be able to unmute if you want to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. I can't put the answer in. I know what I want to put in, but it's not allowing me. Wow. Okay, so uh, Tom, would you go ahead and put the poll up now, and then the people can type their answers in, and hopefully, Thank you, Professor. it'll work out. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think we have a, a. I think we have everybody who's going to respond. Let's go ahead and see how things went. And yes, C is the best answer. And everybody else's response is six percent or less. So those are lesser choices here. Yeah, perfection is not attainable, and you can never. You, you can't assure there's never a data breach. Um, you don't have to have the most sophisticated or the most sophist or most expensive or the most advanced technology. Um, and you don't. You can't just buy the most recent stuff and just default install it. <laughs> this guy get configured. Um, so C is gonna be your, your best choice here. And then thank everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing Tom, if that's okay. okay. Oh, stop sharing. All right, so I think now we should take a, a 10 minute break. Um, we're running a little bit behind schedule. I have 654 on my calendar. So if we'll come back at 704, unless people wanna just power through, I guess there's other choices. Um, that, that could be, that could be a big poll <laughs> choice. <laughs> Talk about a very quick poll here, uh, of the group, um, uh, for a 10 minute break and B power through no break a take a break. Oh, no break is winning. Oh, even now head to head. Oh, this is like a horse race. This is so cool. All right, I see I see the majority opinion. Um, more than two thirds of the group is in favor of powering through. So we'll do that, uh, which means that we won't take a 10 minute break here. Okay, um, so instead what I will do is go to the next section. Thank you so much for your feedback. So we've hit these points already. Um, there's no such thing as set it and forget it cybersecurity. 
you have to constantly adapt and evolve. Um, the mantra that we're going to get into in a moment here is to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And we'll talk about intrusion detection. We'll get into that. Um, and then perfection is impossible. Uh, and so your IT vendors, if they tell you this, they're not being credible. I've already mentioned CIS, um, the New York State's Enterprise Information Security Office, another good source for information and help with respect to cybersecurity. We've talked about encryption. I think I'm going to blow through these slides here. I'm probably going to skim down to where I want to get to since we're running a little bit behind schedule. And the big idea here is, is that except in special circumstances, you do not have to use encryption. My personal opinion is you should be using it, but it's not an ethical requirement. So I will tell you the answer to this question, again, because I want to get caught up to um, my other section here. The question is, is there a duty for lawyers to encrypt client data and or communication with the clients? And the answer, the best choice is B, no. The consensus is that in general and except in special circumstances, the use of email, including unencrypted email, is a proper method of communicating with clients. Um, even though my personal view is A, that's not the official answer. The official answer is B. B is the best answer. There's a big thing about metadata. I'm going to skim through this very quickly here because I want to get to the intrusion detection plans. Um, the big idea here is that there's data about data. So your file name of your Word document, the date it was created, the author of the document, this is all data about data. And you have an obligation to redact this information if it's embedded in the document. For example, a red line. Law firms often will redline different versions of a contract or agreement. And if you're not careful, you may send a version of the document that preserves the history of those red lines. And that would be um, a failure to preserve the confidentiality of your information on your part here. Um, and let me go ahead and I'm just going to skim through this because I want to hop down to the next part, which is the fundamentals of incident response. Okay, great. So our goal here is to be done a little bit quickly. Oh, I see a hand is raised. Let's go ahead and look at the hand, hand raised. Okay, Gerard can speak. Yes, thank you, Professor. My question is, uh, while we're not required to have encryption, uh, what would happen if we're dealing with, in, with a client who happens to be in a state where there is encryption required? That's a great question. So this is me just kind of thinking of, you know, off the top of my head, first impression is that for... For the point of legal compliance, my instinct is that if there was like a lawsuit for say negligence, like negligence type security, um, my instinct is that the laws of the client may come and, and have a say on this. That's my instinct. Now from a state bar association point of view, it's New York State Bar. So from the ethical point of view, that's one question, but from like a point of view of like, like litigation um, for, for, for negligence, I, my instinct is that the, that the client state laws are going to have some say. Um, I think we need to do the personal jurisdiction um, points of contacts test. I don't know how it comes out. It's going to depend upon the facts of the case. But I know that courts are going to want to protect the law firm client because the presumption is that the, the client is less sophisticated than the law firm. Now, again, with a, like a big company, your client's going to be different. Um, but in general, it's going to be this idea that that the that the the service provider, the law firm, has an obligation to to, to um, look at the um, the laws where the client's coming from. I do know if your client's an EU citizen, EU law is going to apply. If your client is a California resident, California law is going to apply. So, so that, that, that seems to be the case. States tend to reach pretty far. If companies outside of New York State reach in here and do business in New York State, then New York State says, "Yeah, we're going to apply our law to you." Um, if, if you're dealing with our citizens, our, 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 our um, residents. A good question. Thank you. Okay. So um, the second half is a little different here. When I teach this with smaller groups, I have a lot of small group breakout exercises. And so my apologies is that we just can't do that. So I'm going to end up lecturing through a lot of content that would have been discovered um, in small groups. And as a result, it's going to leave some more time on the back end for open Q&A. So my intent is to look at this calendar or this, this pro schedule 
um, around 7.30, 7.35. So in about half an hour, I want to get to a big open Q&A. So I plan on getting to these, these last two points through pretty quickly. And if I don't, then um, uh, Dean Rosenberger will let me know um, to do so. Okay, so let's talk about incident response here. Um, there's this idea of really preparing for the disaster before it occurs. Prepare for the data breach before it occurs. You don't want to you don't want to have a data breach happen and then scrambling trying to figure out what you should do. You need to in advance have a checklist. And there are all kinds of law firms and IT firms that will help you create a plan of action for when having it in writing and have it done before the data breach happens. And so in this plan of action there will be a series of steps. So you're going to have preparation, detection, containment, eradication, recovery, and then your follow-up. So it's going to be part of any um, decent incident response or cyber intrusion response plan. A bonus tool that is, is going to be helpful is uh, the ransomware self-assessment tool. It's, it's a very simple thing you can get. So I, I am on the board of a bank. Um, and so one of the things they brought me on for was because of my background in cybersecurity. And I recommend it, it was with financial institutions. I recommend they use the, um, the, uh, the bankers uh, um, electronic crimes task force checklist here. And so there's, there's, there's a link at the bottom. I can't see it. My, my uh, Zoom is blocking the link. Oh, how interesting. Oh, there it is. So when you get the slide, you'll be able to go to um, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's Secret Services website, and and actually, and actually see the uh, the document. But it's a series of basic questions that you can apply, and it's not just for banking. It applies just find the courts and to law firms. It's, 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 it's just as good. Um, and and it's, it's a very simple. It's like an eighteen page document. It's a very simple checklist that's very helpful here. Um, okay, so incident. We've talked about this before. That a event. And an incident are different things. That an event is just random activity that might or might not be suspicious. Whereas an adverse event is where there was clearly an intrusion or there was clearly damage. And that data breach is when there's a confirmed compromise of confidential information on your system. You can think of these different cyber incidences as having different levels of severity. And based upon the levels of severity, you will involve different amounts of stakeholders in the organization. So if it's a low severity, where there's very, very minimal impact, like just spam, we all get spam email, or there might be one computer that got a virus. You don't need to mobilize the entire ID department and all of your PR communications team and the head executive, so the chief of the court or the CEO, they have to mobilize. It's also a low severity event. A medium severity event is where the incident has an impact that's more significant. For example, you may have delayed ability to provide services, meet the mission, or delayed delivery of critical electronic data transfers. For example, maybe there's been a denial of service attack, a DOS attack, where people are pinging your website, so people can't get to your court's website, so it's, it, the, the website's down. That's, that might be a medium to a high impact, so you probably need to mobilize a number of individuals to deal with your website, website being down. It may be a mission critical to have your website functioning. High is when the impact is severe. So this is when a mission critical function cannot take place. If your court system is primarily based upon paper, then it might be the case that losing the website is not mission critical. If your court has transitioned from paper to being entirely electronic, then the website being down is mission critical, particularly when there's deadlines involved because people have to worry about the statute of limitations or you, the court, have imposed a deadline upon the parties before you. And so you need to have the website be up so they can submit things. And if they can't email you either because the, the mail server is down, then that's definitely going to be severe or high. Um, and then extreme is when it's catastrophic. For example, in 2014, the Sony Corporation had a hack from the North Korean country that actually deleted information on their computers and damaged the computer's hard drives with a remote virus attack. It exposed emails that were embarrassing and led to vice presidents getting fired, and it led to the delayed production of certain movies or not actually releasing them at all. That was an extreme impact. 
um, Sony was required to use actual paper for some time because they couldn't use their email. Like that, that, they couldn't actually function anymore. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting. It had fax and, and paper in 2014. Okay, so the next issue is going through the stages here of preparation, detection, containment, eradication, recovery, and then follow up. So preparation is the anchor of your incident response effort. Prepare for the disaster before the disaster occurs. A suitable incident response policy should address and include a number of components, including what is the purpose and objectives of your plan? What's the scope? Who is going to be involved and when? What events are considered to be security-related incidences? So an event could be just like, hey, we've got a weird connection request. Whereas an incident is actually, it's an adverse, it's actually harmful. What risks are okay? Who has what role? How do you evaluate it? And what are the reporting requirements? So when there's a data breach, every state has a reporting requirement. Well, what are your reporting requirements in your state? And who's going to actually make that happen here? So what you want to do is you want to have in the court system a computer, a cybersecurity incident response team, a CSIRT, and it may consist of your IT department. It may consist of it's a, it's a PR communications department, and of course uh, the chief of the court. Um, uh, the chief judge should be part of this team here. And you want to have checklists to follow. So you don't have to think about it. You've already, um, it's like you're going to play a football game. You have your your, your game, your playbook. You have your playbook in advance. Um, you want to conduct the disaster recovery exercises to um, test how well it works. So do you have backups that work well? Have you dry run? Did, did, you, did you test your, your plan? Um, and do this regularly, at least every year have a dry run where you test your, your, your plan to make sure you can respond to disaster. Your checklist of a combination of both technical and non-technical measures. So you're gonna worry about things on the non-technical side, such as do I have the phone number for the local police department and for the FBI? Do I have those, those contacts? Um, do we have our computer network systems? Is there actually a diagram of how they communicate and how they work together? Um, do we have a paper copy of things? So if, if, if email is the only way you communicate, then what's your backup? Do you have cell phones to back up? What happens if your file server is taken down? Is there a paper backup for your, how, what, 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 how do you, so what happens if the response plan itself is only in a Word document or a PDF? So if your response plan stuff is, is on a PDF on your file server and that's down, then you don't even have a copy of your response plan. So at least have a paper copy of the incident response plan itself, right? Basic stuff here. Uh, on the technical side of it, it's all of your devices, uh, like laptops and, and uh, you know, uh, routing stations and having clean images. So your IT folks will be really worried about the, about the um, technical side of the house. Detection. How do you know whether or not there actually was an incident? So you gotta have ways of doing this. And then the important thing here is log files. So what your IT team should be doing is keeping a record of every connection request to your system and all of the activity happening. So which IP addresses are trying to send email to and from your organization? Which IP address is trying to connect to your website from the outside and from the inside, who's connecting outward? So these things are you gonna keep in your log file. So all these are, are basically tracking and keeping a history of, of activities. If feasible, you want to always have regular backups. Maybe it's weekly for some organizations. Maybe it's daily for others. Maybe for your hospitals every hour. So for the, your court system, you need to figure out what frequency of backup makes sense for your systems. And if you do determine that there was an incident, you need to initiate the notification process. So that would mean bringing in the other members of the incident response effort, informing your security contacts, local police, FBI, and so on, your PR office, and your legal department if you have one for this. You wanna contain the breach. So containment means you're gonna to have to be a part of that team and make a decision 
about what to do to contain the data breach. Do you shut down a single computer, a single system, a whole office, the entire system, all computers? Do you shut it down? Do you also disconnect it from the network? Do you leave it turned on, but you monitor the machine? Do you turn off that mode machine and you monitor the network in its entirety? Do you shun certain outside websites locations so you put them on your blacklist that can't connect to you? Do you not shun them, but you create a honey trap where you provide information that may be fake, may be true, that might be attractive to an external uh, actor? Do you disable some features? Well, we're having problems with HTML. We're having problems with a particular feature on the computer. Or do you disable an entire account? So this user is problematic. So thinking about all of these approaches that are things you will do as part of your response team. Maybe you wanna just issue a cease and desist message. So you know where the bad conduct is coming from and you can email them or call them or send them a, a paper mail, snail mail letter and say, we order you, we demand that you cease and desist trying to connect to our computer or trying to access our systems. That may be their first one. So, so all these are possibilities that make, make sense. We have a question Yes. in the chat. Um, is Malwarebytes Premium an acceptable personal firewall for electronic legal communication purposes? Also, is it acceptable for automatic updates to security software to be used? Yeah, great question. Um, many years ago, I was familiar with all of the um, common free software systems such as malware bytes and I just am not current on that today but I, I used to always use Kapersky until Kapersky was starting to have back doors to Moscow the Russian Federation they're just spying through Kapersky antivirus uh, I used to use Norton antivirus I go through a number of systems here and what I realized for Windows and for my home use is that the default Windows Defender is more than adequate for my purposes. And so I stopped relying upon these other vendors as you use Fender. Um, malware bytes is good. It, it's a good system. Um, whether or not it's sufficient by itself really depends upon the kinds of data you have, how sensitive it's going to be, um, what the risk of disclosure is going to, is going to be. And, and, and really, it's going to be a number of questions. So for example, I use my work laptop which has been configured by our IT department to have certain security features to hold work data. And I don't put it on my personal computer because I don't want to have the burden of ensuring that my personal computer has those same IT security standards. And I don't want to be somehow held liable if there is a breach from my home computer. Whereas if there's a breach from my work computer, I can say, well, look, you guys, <laughs> you don't want to secure my computer. So Malwarebytes, um, I can't say that it's bad. I can't say that it's good. It's really going to, I'm going to need more information about that. And I would really ask your IT department to say, hey, based upon what our organization is doing, based upon my role and the data that I have, does this make sense? Um, what I can tell you is you need to have something. You need to have a defender or have a firewall. You need to have something. So I would say that Malwarebytes is definitely better than nothing, but whether it's sufficient is, is going to require a lot more information. But, but good question. I, I have a, a question, uh, somewhat somewhat related. So I, I'm thinking about our oath, um, our our administrative court, and there are ALJs which do trials, and then we also have hearing officers. Um, hearing officers are their per diem, and many of our hearing officers at oath um, are also solo practitioners, right? So I, I know that there are several of them on the chat, and I'm thinking for you know a solo practitioner, say. Um, what does the security response look like there if you primarily use, um, uh, you know, the cloud, like you use Office 365 or maybe use Google Docs, and that's pretty much where most of your documents are kept. What, what is all, because I, I hear what you're saying about all this for a larger organization, for the court itself, um, but for smaller practitioners, what does this look like? Yeah, great question. So you're a sole proprietor or you're a two or three person um, law firm or you're a, a judge on a circuit, um, or you're in a small town and you maybe show up once a week or twice a month um, uh, into uh, having a court hearings, um, what's reasonable in that circumstance? And, and the bottom line here, or what, what do you do when you have an incident? 
is that you still want to go through these steps. Um, so I, I would say it still makes sense to have a consultant help help you create a plan. Um, and and you're still going to want to go through, um, you know. So 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 I am a sole proprietor and I have a breach. What do I do? So the first thing you should have a phone number and an email for somebody who's savvy in IT. So there should be um, maybe a digital forensics firm, um, maybe an IT consultant, but somebody that can help you deal with um, cyber forensics. Because once you've had a data breach, you're going to have to have somebody come in and help you clean it up. That, that's so, so you're going to have to have the a point of contact. That that's the first question here. Uh, in order to detect it, so again. There should be somebody, maybe inside, maybe outside, looking through the Google Docs usage or looking through the cloud to let you know if it's a data breach. Maybe Google Docs will tell you. Maybe that cloud storage solution will tell you. That's a possibility. Um, and, and so then the burden is going to come back on you to figure out how severe it is. Hey, you're not an IT, you're unlikely to be an IT expert. You, you, maybe you are one, but chances are you are. So you should get somebody that's going to help you out with that. And you say, hey, um, Jane Doe, John Doe, friend of mine, consultant person, department person, um, I just learned that we had a shared Google Doc that contained uh, information that was under seal um, because it dealt with something, I don't know, uh, allegations of child abuse in and in a contested uh, child custody hearing, prior to divorce, um, and it's been compromised. I need to figure out what the, what the scale of it is. I mean, maybe it's only three or four people, the parents and children that are involved. Maybe it's not, maybe the compromise is, is the, the number of individuals are small. But what are my reporting requirements? So again, in your plan, you're, you're, you're I'm on the wrong computer here. Here we go. Um, so then on your plan, you will have noted your point of contact as well as uh, what your data breach notification timelines are. Is it 48 hours? Is it one week? Is it one month? How quickly do you have to inform people? Is it just those who directly impact it? Is there a dollar threshold? Is it irregardless of dollar? So, so you need to actually think about in advance of what those requirements are instead of trying to scramble at the last minute, which is problematic. Um, and, then, uh, and then this idea of containment means that Maybe if it's a Google Doc or something in the cloud, you might have to restrict access to that Google Doc or to the cloud, which means that maybe people who are relying upon it to communicate can't get access to it anymore, but you need to shut off access because an unauthorized party has gotten into that document. And so you're trying to contain the amount of damage by restricting access there. So, so it's, it's gonna be, Fairly straightforward, but just following the same checklist. It's just, it's just instead of being a hundred people, it's just one person. Instead of being a billion dollar deal, it's maybe it's a thousand dollars. The scale may be different. The steps are going to be the same. Yeah, good question. Right, so that brings us to eradication, where you want to try to eradicate the cause of the incident. Um, you may even need to, like the clean off any machines. So again, you have a cybersecurity expert to help you do that. Um, and make sure your backups are clean as well. And if you have a PR team, then you involve them in the loop. And finally, you want to do recovery, which is return back to being operational again and making certain that you can have um, your operations continue. So maybe you have to change passwords and an all clear. These kinds of steps may be part of your recovery. And then the follow-up is to review and integrate information you learned from the incident itself and maybe prepare a report. So again, if you're a sole proprietor, it may be a one page report. <laughs> it may be a very short memorandum for the record report to the file where you say this happened, this happened, and then bam, bam, you're done. It may not be a thousand page document, it may just be maybe one page, but you're gonna make a record for your, uh, memorandum for your record of what occurred on, on your follow-up. All right. Let's skip through to the second code word which is duty. The second code word is duty. Okay. And now we had a second code word is duty. We're going to go to contracting issues in cloud computing. And I'm going to spend maybe about 10 minutes here and then do the final open Q&A. So 
what is cloud computing? Why do we do it? What are the benefits? What are the legal ethical obligations around cloud computing? And then um, normally I'd have small groups analyzing the Amazon Web Services, the AWS customer agreement, but I'm just gonna go ahead and just give you the answer. So <laughs> there'll be a little bit of the lack of discovery there. The cloud is just using a machine that's not co-located with you. So I'm using machine in Texas, I'm using machine in, in Canada. It's somewhere else and that's gonna hold my data. My data is in the cloud. It's somewhere that's not local to my organization. There's a couple of ways you can buy cloud store solutions. It might be software as a service or platform as a service or infrastructure as a service. It doesn't really matter. You're just gonna you're just gonna have it somewhere else. It's not in your local organization. You can design it yourself. You can have somebody who's a third party contractor make it for you, or you can use Amazon Web Services for their public cloud or Google Docs, right? So there could be um, these kind of public clouds. You reduce your capital costs. It's highly scalable and very flexible. It allows you to provide shared resources and it gives you service on demand. From a legal point of view, there are a couple of risks, including subpoenas and e-discovery, compliance and enforcement. You may have some data protection issues. The terms in the vendor contracts could be problematic. You may have licensing issues. And there's always these problems with cross jurisdiction, a couple of the issues, legally speaking. There could be policy technical risks. You get locked into a technology platform. You can't get out of it. Um, or you may end up having resource exhaustion, or even worse, something that was once free becomes paid for. I used to have um, several gigabytes of photos on Flickr, F-L-I-K-R, I think it was, or C-K-R, um, and they promised to be free for life, and then they went to a paid version, and I couldn't get access to my photos without paying them for it. And I tried to download my photos, and they would not let me download the photos in the same format that I had upload the photos into the system. So unfortunately, it became a problem where I had all these like gibberish file names and it, it became completely useless to me. So, I, so that basically my data was held hostage. So the risk here is that if you're not careful, if there is a change in the, the business model, your data could be held hostage by the, by the platform. So bottom line here is yes, New York legal ethics law permits us to use cloud computing, subpoena 842. Um, the key phrase here that I'm gonna highlight before I dive into the Amazon web services agreement is that the vendor must have an enforceable obligation to preserve confidentiality. So your third party vendor must have an enforceable obligation to preserve confidentiality and security and should notify the lawyer if served with process for client data. So you as a lawyer have an obligation under rule 1.6 to maintain client secrets. Your vendor doesn't. So if the government serves a subpoena upon you, you can resist that subpoena as you are a lawyer. If the government serves a subpoena for your data to a third party vendor, they can't resist because they aren't the law firm. So just be aware of the distinction here. So this is an important thing under um, opinion 842. And I think I'm gonna skip these other opinions and go directly to the up. Uh, this question, I'll give you the answer very quickly here. Okay, what's the question? Under what circumstances may a judge or lawyer store litigants or client secrets with a third party cloud computing vendor? And the best answer is A, if the vendor has an enforceable obligation to preserve confidentiality and security and will notify the lawyer serve process of data. That's the key point here. Um, the other answers aren't as good. This, this stumbling block here, A, is a reason why um, is the reason why most firms, most large law firms do not store their clients' data in the cloud um, because it's hard to get the vendors to agree to this. It's hard to get that done. So we have a question about yes. that, actually. Um, this person says, is there a clearinghouse or a listing of compliant third-party vendors? Yeah, I've been asked that question before and I don't know of one. That would be a great service to provide. Um, I, I, I don't know of one. Great question. Is there another hand raise or that, that the only one? Yes, there is um, a hand raise from uh, our commissioner. Um, and I uh, believe you are on mute. You are allowed to unmute yourself. Awesome. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. So this might be a little off topic, but 
it's more of a discovery related question and discovery obligations typically have to do with records that are in, in an entity's custody and control. But when using cloud computing, sometimes the mm -hmm. vendors who have the cloud, who own those servers will not certify that you have you have evergreen custody and control to these records because they don't even know where they are. They could be shifted between 10 different servers mm -hmm. in five different oceans at any given time. And so mm -hmm. the, the cloud computing companies are unwilling to really say, you can have immediate access to mm -hmm. all of these records such that you have custody and control, but the, the companies have to be able to say, I have custody and control of this record. So mm -hmm. is that something that remains an open kind of murky area or has there been some guidance on that? Again, it's it's more discovery than cybersecurity, but yeah. somehow these things blend together. Any thoughts yeah, they, on that they, would be? Yeah, they definitely, I mean, terrific question and they, they definitely overlap. Um, I have not refreshed my collection on the most recent decisions in that, in that area. Um, the last that I checked, it was still murky. So if you do have more recent information, please let me know because I haven't I haven't followed up on that recently, but that's my last recollection. What I will say is that, um, for legal service providers, you are still bound by your legal ethical duties. And in that, it means that most legal service providers just won't use these companies because they can't, they can't guarantee the custody of the documents. Like that, that, that's an issue. Um, but if you're not a law firm or a court system, I think it's still murky. It's, it's, it's a good question. We have another question in the chat. How would you know if the vendor has an enforceable obligation regarding confidentiality? It's a term in the contract. Yeah, so, so vendors aren't going to, well, the majority of vendors will not voluntarily put into the contract. It's gonna be how much leverage do you have and how much money you're gonna pay. You're gonna to have to get them to add it to the contract that says this obligation is there. So the answer is you're gonna to have to tell them to put it into the contract. Great question. Okay. So I'm going to jump down to the uh, web sources agreement. Here we go. So the hypothetical that motivates this, and, and unfortunately, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to uh, really explore it the way that I wanted to do in, in small groups, is this. Your organization is considering transitioning its email, its web, and its data storage from in-house to the cloud. Um, and you want to make certain that your use of the cloud computing satisfies both your individual and organizational ethical duties as, as lawyers. And so what you're doing is you're gonna consider using the Amazon Web Services, the AWS platform as your, as your platform. And so you're gonna analyze this, this document to see what's missing. Are there any issues triggered and what advice you would have on whether to adopt it or not? I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you the issues. So we're jumping, jumping to the answers here. Um, what I will tell you is that if you read through it, there are probably a dozen provisions that flag problems. And I'm focusing on the top five which is section three on security and data privacy, section six on temporary suspension, section 9.1, general identification, section 10 disclaimers, and section 11, limitations of liability. Um, you should have received in the materials for this class, either the URL or the document itself, that's the um, AWS agreement. Um, and then also what's missing from this discussion of insurance, and then there's always an issue with definitions, but I'm gonna skip those for today's discussion. So on the section three, in three we have point a, one, Sorry, okay, before you question. get into that, uh, quest, I don't want this person's question to get lost. What data protection measures or items should be sought from an adversary in disclosure and their vendors and consultants before turning over responsive data? Yeah, great question. So with respect to third party vendors, you want them by contract to certify that they are compliant with some industry standard for cybersecurity and data privacy. So maybe they'll say we are compliant with ISO 27001. Maybe they'll say we're compliant with the NIST framework for cybersecurity. Or maybe they'll say they're compliant with the 20 um, critical security controls from CIS, but there's some framework standard that we're compliant with. And also that we um, will certify that we're going to preserve the confidentiality of, of the data you share with us. So that should be in the agreement with a third party vendor. Um, and then if you're looking with adversaries, so you're talking about doing e-discovery and, and data transfers, part of the e-discovery agreements that, law, that firms and parties typically draft up um, should include some stipulations about taking reasonable security safeguards around protecting the confidentiality of the data. 
Um, it should be in your in your uh, agreements. Um, very important. Good question. So in section three point one of the contract, it talks about AWS security, and what it says is that without limiting section ten or your obligations under section four point two, we will implement reasonable and appropriate measures designed to help you secure your content against accidental or unlawful loss access disclosure. So basically, you got to ask the question: What's reasonable? Um, now. Chances are for Amazon, which is the 800 pound gorilla in the cloud storage solution space, um, maybe it's pretty good, maybe it's not. But I would wanna know what reasonable and appropriate means because it's going to vary depending upon who your vendor is. And if it's a mid-sized company or a small company, it may be different yet again. So that's an important question. 3.2 is that you may specify what region in the world your content will be stored in. It's very important. I don't wanna store it in China. I don't want to sort it in Russia. I want to sort it in the United States. And I want to pick the right state too. Maybe it's Texas. Maybe it's not Texas, right? So you got to pick where it's going to be stored. Um, but what I find interesting is this. Amazon says, we will not access or use your content except as necessary to maintain and provide the service offerings, which again may mean they're going to read your content like Gmail, Google Mail gets read by, by, uh, by Google, they may be reading your content just the same way or as necessary to comply with the law or a binding order of a governmental body. So if Amazon gets a subpoena or a warrant for your data, they will turn it over. That's what this says here. So if you have an obligation to fight the government's request for your, your client's data, then putting it into the cloud is going to frustrate your fulfillment of that obligation to your clients. It's going to be a problem. So this is a provision where you would need to somehow find a different vendor or negotiate better. For example, the CIA uses AWS. I guarantee you the CIA's version of this contract does not have this language. So just be aware that your market power will, will determine the terms of the agreement. Um, a quick question yeah. about that. So actually, I think you, you pretty much answered this person's question in the chat, but I, I ask you to speak a little more and I'll read the question. How is a cloud company able to successfully defend against release of attorney client communication if the company's activities are not covered under attorney client relationship? Can such a relationship be created as by having an agreement by which the company becomes a component of the attorney's law firm? And you touched on that with the CIA example, um, but I'm wondering if you could speak a little yeah. more. So, so the short answer is, is that if your data is in AWS machine in Russia and the Russian government wants that data, AWS will turn it over. If it's on the machine in Texas and it says Texas wants your data, Texas is going to turn it over. So AWS is going to comply with that government order. They're not going to resist it. They're not, they're not going to do it. Well, then, so how do you bring into the scope of attorney client privilege this data? Well, the answer is you need to have the provider of the IT service be part of your organization as an employee, as a department, and the machines need to be owned by your organization. So if you're doing it, so basically, so basically you say your, 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 your cloud solution can't be outsourced. <laughs> Why? Because the, once you have a third party, they're not part of your organization. They're separate from you. And so they can't defend against the government subpoena. So this is exactly why most large firms don't use cloud storage solutions. Another issue here is suspension. So Amazon can unilaterally suspend your access to your data in the cloud. If Amazon believes that your use poses a security risk. So maybe you got hacked and the hackers did bad things. And so now Amazon will cut off your access to the data. Or maybe they think they're going to be accused of some type of a IP, copyright, trademark, patent infringement or something. And so they're going to cut off your access. So, or I think you're doing fraudulent behavior. Or they think you haven't paid your bill. So they can cut off your access if they think these are issues here. And not only can they cut off your access, but you still have to keep paying them. So you now don't have your client's data and you have to keep paying Amazon to store the data you don't have access to. 
identification. So this language has changed over time. Um, the versions from five years ago, four years ago, were, were even worse than the versions you're seeing now. So this, this has been, this is modified, um, but it's still pretty bad. So you, the client of Amazon, will defend, identify, and hold harmless us, our affiliates and licensors, and each of their respective employees, officers, directors, and representatives from and against any losses arising out of or relating to any third-party claim concerning your use of our systems, your breach of our agreement, a dispute between you and any users. Um, so basically, you're, you're on the hook to identify them. Um, this is a big deal here. Disclaimers. So they are not promising anything. Amazon is saying, we're giving you a park bench in Central Park, New York. And you have chosen to put your valuables, to put your wallet, to put your purse, to put, to put your cash on this park bench. We're not promising anything at the park bench. It maybe it's gonna break, it's gonna collapse. Maybe somebody's gonna come in and steal things off the park bench, right? So there's no warranties here. We're not warranting anything about express, implied, or statutory. We're not promising anything uh, relating to merchantability, satisfactory quality, fitness for a particular purpose, non-infringement, and quiet enjoyment. No implied or express warranties are, are, are arising here. So it's all on you. That means you have to encrypt your own data before you put it into the cloud. So you have to bring your own safe to put it onto Amazon's park bench. You have to hire your own security guard to watch the safe you're putting on the Amazon's park bench. They're just giving you a park bench. They're not promising anything about the bench. Nothing's being promised here. And section 11, limitations of liability. So again, Lynx was worse in the earlier versions of this. It's, it's a little bit better now. Uh, uh. So basically, Amazon will not be liable for any indirect, incidental, special, consequential, or exemplary damages, including for lost profits. So you lost access to your systems, and now you lost money lost revenues, lost customers, lost opportunities, goodwill use of data, even if a party has been advised of the possibility of such damages. We're not gonna compensate you, reimburse you for any damages arising in connection with, A, you can't use our services because they're dirt down. Or that's one. Two, we discontinue some of our offerings because we will unilaterally change things. Three, we have to maintain systems. So it comes down for system maintenance. Or there's other issues in the background here. So again, they're not promising you anything more than the park bench. And should the park bench break or not work well and you lose money, it's not their fault. And that's where I'm going to stop for the open Q&A. So let's stop here. OK, well, there's a question. Um, what are your thoughts with respect to cloud backup slash storage solution on encrypting all data in some sort of compressed archive, such as a zip with at least 256-bit AES encryption, and then sending the archive to the cloud? If the third-party vendor then ends up getting a subpoena or otherwise is compelled to disclose the data, then the receiving party will still have to hack through the encryption. Granted, this is extremely cumbersome, and being a solo, I do not do this myself, but it could potentially obviate the need to aggressively audit the third-party vendor's adoption mm -hmm. and or compliance of industry standards. So um, great suggestion and great question. So the idea here is, look, um, AWS, the, the cloud source solution, Amazon says, we aren't your backup. You got to have your other own backup besides Amazon. So that's the first point here. Um, and, so, and so maybe the idea is, well, look, let me, the creator and holder of the information, the data, let me figure out how to, on my own, encrypt it. Like, that's the first idea. Okay, that makes sense. And then that way, if there's a subpoena for that file, then the government only gets the, 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 the locked safe. They still got to crack the safe. And if I use strong encryption, so when you see the advanced encryption standard AES, and you see 256 bits, that's, that's a strong encryption then it's going to take hundreds, if not the lifetime of the universe, longer than we're alive to crack that encryption, right? Um, I think it's creative. I think it's a, I think it's a good idea. Um, it may be a way for you 
to satisfy your ethical obligations of preserving your client's secrets because it's encrypted before it gets into the cloud. And if it's somehow delivered to the government, they, they, they still can't read it. it it's, it's a good suggestion. Yeah. All right, another one. Are you seeing more attorneys use the Signal app given that messages and calls cannot be accessed by us or other third parties because they have been found to ensure end-to-end -end encrypted, yeah. private, and secure? What are your thoughts about Signal as a tool to avoid hacking? Yeah, I think Signal's a great tool. Um, be aware that there's no perfect firewall, there's no perfect castle, everything can be compromised, including Signal, but I think it's still a good tool I am seeing more law firms use it, and I encourage you to consider using it. It's definitely a good tool. All right, another one. There are practice management platforms like Clio, Practice Panther for Attorneys. Are those platforms more compliant? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked at the practice management platforms. My assumption is that the answer ought to be yes, but without actually reviewing the contractual provisions, I can't say for sure. But I think the instinct there is that they, they ought to be, but read the contracts carefully. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A or in the chat at the moment. Okay, well, I'm up on email. And I gave you my cell phone and the slide materials as well as my office phone. Oh, so, sorry. There's, okay. there's one. <laughs> I there is one more. Here. Great. There, I, I think people are just still typing. Uh, this one says, in February 1883, August um, ooh, Kurchakov, a.k.a. the father of all computer security, published in the Journal of Military Science an article that set forth the foundation for modern cryptography. What did that pretend over 140 years ago about the critical nexus between computer security and national defense? Oh, I haven't read that article. It sounds really good to read. If you if you email to me, I appreciate it. I, I wouldn't mind reading it. Um, what I what I can talk about things in general, but I haven't read that article in particular, um, is that in World War II, um, there are three reasons why we why the Allies defeated the Axis. Um, one of them. Is 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 that uh, we developed nuclear bombs? <laughs> this is very very important. Uh, the first to get nuclear bombs is, is going to be a, a, a prevailer. Um, the second is um, that the Germans were unable to get their um, long range missiles deployed quickly enough. Um, that would have been a game changer. And the third reason is that we were better on cryptography and encryption. Um, and so we were able to crack a number of uh, uh, German Japanese encryption codes, um, one of which was Enigma. You may have seen the movie on Enigma. Um, there was a British computer scientist, um, a brilliant individual who in his mind was able to crack an incredibly complicated um, cipher and that allowed us to prevail. Um, so I can tell you from World War II, encryption is the key. That is the case through this day. So all of our commerce, all of our financial data, it's really just one big encrypted number. Um, and if it wasn't well encrypted, then we couldn't have those systems. All of our classified government systems are really just encrypted communication, so, so it's key. Um, but going back to the 1800s, I don't know what he said in the article. What I can tell you is that the idea of encryption goes back for at least four or 5,000 years. For example, Caesar had a cipher, the Caesar cipher, and that's just the take the, the uh, Roman alphabet and just move all the letters one over. So make A's go to B, B's go to C. So if you have the word the, T-H-E, then you just make all the letters higher. Um, so then um, actually, what is it? T goes to, what is it? U, H goes to I, E goes to F. And that's a very, so basically it's like a plus one. So you take, you take the numerical value of the letter and you add one to it, you get another number. So with encryption, you just take a mathematical formula and you just make a numerical formula on all of these input values. So, um, so it's definitely very important. But please send me that article from 1883. I haven't read it. Um, it sounds really good. I have a, a question. You'd mentioned, um, well, I'll, you know what? Somebody just popped in with a question. I'll read their question first. Is it safe to use Google Drive or OneDrive to share sensitive legal documents, say, with opposing counsel and hearing officers? Yeah, define safe. So, so here's the deal. Um, 
my personal view is that the um, most commonly used cloud storage solutions like Google Docs in, in uh, Microsoft uh, OneDrive um, have flaws. However, comma, it has become accepted to use things like Google Docs and OneDrive to share documents even if they contain sensitive and or confidential information. Um, so I, I don't like the word safe. I would use the word, um, you will not be found to violate your legal obligations or your ethical obligations by using these cloud source solutions, assuming that there have not been other um, failures in your security um, practices. So assuming that your other practices are, are in line, you won't be found to be that. But I, I, it's, it's, you know, safe is like a, it's, it's a subjective term here. I, I don't know what safe means. I, I, all I can say is like you won't be found to be to be in violation. Um, but if you ask me in Dean Haynes' opinion, would would you rely upon that? I would prefer to have an even higher standard. Um, but but what I suspect, and I don't have proof of this, is that the OneDrive and um, and the Google Docs aren't being used for the multi-billion dollar deals. Is is my suspicion? But I could be wrong. Um, it's, it's a good question. Okay, so there's another question, and I'm, I'm going to sneak my question in at the back end of this. Uh, so this person asks, we've been speaking about safeguarding data primarily on our computer systems, but what about cellular devices? Can you speak about any safeguards there? Yeah, and great then, question. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so one of the commentators mentioned Signal, and that's, that's a, a way of encrypting some of the data on your cell phones. Um, so there are a number of tools that you can obtain to do so. And I think it is important. Remember, uh, for example, the US government's position is that when you go through a border, which is a seaport or an airport or um, the land between Canada and the US or Mexico and the US, you go through a border. Actually, when you're within 100 miles of a border, and most Americans live within 100 miles of a border, um, the government can search your devices. So there's, there's an issue there about what security means. And so your devices include your cell phone. Um, the reason why I don't use my face or my thumbprint to unlock my cell phone is that the court cases under the Fourth Amendment say that if you hold the cell phone to my face or force me to put my thumb on the cell phone, that is not compelled testimony. But if you say to me that I have to give you my four-digit PIN number, that is compelled testimony. So something in my head, something I know, can be testimony, but something that I am, my body is not. Um, so let's be aware then that, in, that cell phone encryption matters. And so you might want to use a four digit pin rather than your thumb or your face or your eyeball to unlock your cell phone. And you may want to use things like WhatsApp or Signal in order to encrypt some of your cell phone communications to make it more secure. Okay, another question. Uh, what is the biggest mistake that organizations make hmm. when it comes to cybersecurity? Yeah, great question. So I, I, I think the biggest mistake is that a number of organizations just don't take it seriously enough. I can tell you that people in the banking industry take it extremely seriously and spend a significant portion of their budget on encrypting financial data because if they have a loss of funds, then they may seems to be a going enterprise. Um, but most organizations aren't taking it seriously enough, which means then that maybe there's, so under New York state law, there's supposed to be a single point of contact. It's either the New York State Shield Act or else it's the 2016 Department of Financial Services and Cybersecurity Law. But one of the statutes says there should be a single point of contact at your organization for cybersecurity. Most organizations do not have a single point of contact. Um, they may just take the IT department, which is focusing on configuring your PCs and your servers, they'll just take care of it somehow, right? Um, but it's not really focused. Most organizations don't have an intrusion response plan. So what happens with, with, with the cyber intrusion, um, they say, we'll just figure it out when it happens. Um, so when I say not taking it seriously enough, I mean, you don't have somebody who thinks about this 24 seven, and you don't have a plan in place. You're not really planning for the data breach before the data breach happens. 
Um, my question. So you mentioned Chat B, Chat GPT earlier on, and I, I've seen a lot of a lot of articles about it, particularly in the academic sphere with you know plagiarism. But I'm wondering um, if you have any thoughts on Chat GPT and its effect on cybersecurity for mm -hmm. say the legal field. Thinking of like social engineering scams, you know, yeah. um, sometimes people, uh, some scammers maybe from outside of the U.S. who have limited English skills, their mm -hmm. their social engineering scams are a little more obvious for a native English speaker. But with something like Chat GPT, you know, how do you yeah. think that affects the game? Yeah, that's a great, great question. I think it's a game changer. I think it's a game changer in so many ways, in so many respects, and so many aspects of life that we can't cover all of them. Um, but on the cybersecurity front and on social engineering, it, it's definitely better. For example, um, uh, one of my colleagues asked ChatGPT to write um, for the president of the college a speech in the style of the president of the college, and it did it. It, it just created a brand new speech that seemed like it came from the communications department for that college. So if there is data out there, about you and how you communicate in writing, then ChatGPT can and will imitate your style if told to do so by the prompt. Which means then, if there's a certain way your boss or your colleague communicates and it's out there in written format, or the way that person communicates is common to a number of people that's out in, out in the cloud, then ChatGPT can copy that style. You can say, hey, write me an essay in the style of Mark Twain. It will do that. It'll have the little witticisms and a little hokey anecdotes, and it'll, it'll be in his style. You can do that. So it's definitely a game changer. Thank you. And so we're coming up on 8 o'clock. I um, want to give maybe a few more minutes. Oh, OK. Uh, here's another question. Is there any way to change settings on Gmail so Google cannot read emails? There are um, third-party encryption apps like Pretty Good Privacy or PGP is one of them. You can buy these and they will encrypt Gmail for you. The problem is that the recipient has to have a decryption tool. So if they don't also have a program to decrypt it, it doesn't do you any good. Um, which means that if you're a law firm, your clients got to have a decryption tool to decrypt the email you sent via Gmail. The way firms typically get around this is that the firm website will be a place where clients are required to log into the firm website, and then your website is secure, and you'll have a secure um, email through the firm's website, and that's how you that's how you get around that. Um, but but you but you can do that. I've read that Google is considering rolling out a feature. That would allow for you to use encryption as part of Google, but I don't know if they're really going to do that or if they're going to maintain a backdoor in that encryption, um, but it has been considered. All right. Um, given the technical competency mm -hmm. requirements, how can law schools support best practice education for students? Do you think law schools are filling this requirement? Yeah, terrific question. So I can tell you that Albany Law School is definitely a leader in this area. Um, we were the first, the first law school to have an online cybersecurity and data privacy LLM and an online cybersecurity and data privacy MSL. Um, so both lawyers and non-lawyers. And we have incorporated this thinking throughout our JD, our residential in-purse JD programming space. Um, in general, law schools are scrambling to keep up um, and in general, um, haven't been as proactive in implementing education training around cybersecurity. Um, the way that they can improve doing so is through having different events such as panels or uh, luncheons or guest lectures um, and encouraging and or requiring students to be a part of those events. Um, most law school students have very few electives because there's so many requirements. So a tension here is whether or not to add an academic for credit requirement to have training in cybersecurity and data privacy. That would be the final way that schools could ensure um, that students be prepared for, the, for the, uh, uh, the changes in technology.
Um, I'll this, just go ahead and answer these questions about the the codes. There were two codes that were um, given throughout the. the yeah, webinar. there weren't codes three and four. There's only two codes. Codes one and two. That's right. Yeah, and Alan, I saw your hand up briefly. I'm not sure if you had a question or comment you wanted to make. Okay, um, I'll take that as a no. All right, um, I don't see any more questions uh, for you, Professor. Um, so I just wanna take the time to say thank you so much. This has been incredibly informative. It's clear that you have a passion um, for this field. Your enthusiasm comes through 100%. Um, Alan, go ahead. <laughs> your hand is back up, Alan. Just unmute yourself and you should be able to, to speak. Professor, I, I mean, I think you're brilliant. You're very sagacious in your presentation. But being that you were in the military, and if you were like an expert in cybersecurity and data privacy, and you were captured by the enemy, are you required to announce the um, fourth article of code of conduct, which reads the following? If I'm a prisoner of war, I will keep my faith with my fellow prisoners. I will give no information or take part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. If I'm a senior, I will take command. If not, I will obey the aw awful orders of those appointed over me and will back them in every way. Are you obligated to give up this secrets to the foreign enemy, even though that you're a service member to the United States government? Thank you so much for the question. Um, I separated from the Air Force, Air Force yes. uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so it's, it's been a while now. I don't know if I'm still under obligation of the code of conduct, but I love hearing it. It sends chills down my spine. It reminds me of, of, of the, the training that we went through when I was in the military. Um, and, and so uh, so the question is, I think it's twofold. If I were still in uniform on active duty, if I was still under those obligations to abide by the code of conduct, then I would give name, rank, and serial number, and then I would stop. And serial numbers is my social security number, so maybe date of birth, right? And, and, and then you're done. Like anything beyond that is beyond what's required by the Geneva Conventions as encoded in the um, Code of Conduct for the Armed Forces. Since I separate from the military and look under the guidance there, um, I my understanding, and I could be wrong on this, is that I have the choice if I am, because when you're captured, it means, if I understand correctly, that you are actually wearing the uniform still. And so I'm actually an active combatant, I'm actually an active soldier. Um, now I'm a, I'm a civilian. I'm not actually a government employee anymore. Alma Law School is a private, a private law school. So as a civilian, non-government employee, if I am held hostage, as opposed to being captured, um, and they begin to interrogate me, um, I don't know that the code of conduct for armed service members protects me. I would instead be protected by Geneva Convention 4. I think 3 is for people in uniform and 4 is for people who aren't in uniform. And so the question then would be about whether or not the adversary could actually ask those questions. And I think under the Geneva Convention 4, the answer is no, because I'm not a combatant. And so I think if they begin to engage in the enhanced interrogation, you get to a whole other rabbit hole. Um, but the long story short is I don't think GC3, which is the name ring serial number, applies to me anymore. I think it's GC4 at this point in time. But but great question. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was brilliant. Thank you. Well, that seems as good a place as any um, to <laughs> wrap up tonight's program. Thank you all so much for attending. Once again, thank you, Professor Haynes. Uh, I want to just an administrative note, Lisa put in the chat, and I just want to remind everyone if you're seeking CLE credit, um, Lisa yesterday sent out uh, some PDFs for you to fill out, and that's where you enter the codes. Um, so just, I just wanted to point that out there. And um, Thank you all. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Oh, beautiful.